With silence comes peace. With peace comes freedom. With freedom comes silence. Just think, what if they had some of the hope that people have? What if demons, with their knowledge of God, had their wickedness restrained? Imagine if a demon, after all his fears about God's judgment, was suddenly led to imagine that God might be his friend, that God might forgive him and let him in, sin and all, to heaven. Oh, the joy, the wonder, the gratitude, we would say. Would not this demon be a great lover of God, since, after all, everybody loves people who help them? What else could cause feelings so powerful and sincere? Is it any wonder that so many people are deceived this way? Especially since people have the demons to promote this delusion. They've been promoting it now for many centuries, and alas, they are very good at it. Now we come to the question, if all these various experiences and feelings come from nothing more than demons are capable of, what are the kinds of experiences that are truly spiritual and holy? What do I have to find in my own heart as a sure sign of God's grace there? What are the differences that show them to be from the Holy Spirit? This is the answer. Those feelings and experience which, experiences which are good signs of God's grace in the heart differ from the experience of demons in their source and their results. Their source is the sense of the overwhelming holy beauty and loveliness of the things of God. When a person grasps in his mind, or better yet, when he feels his own heart held captive by the attractiveness of the divine, this is an unmistakable sign of God's working. The demons and damned in hell do not now, and never will, experience even the tiniest bit of this. Before their fall, the demons did have this sense of God, but in their fall they lost it, the only thing they could lose of their knowledge of God. We have seen how the demons have very clear ideas about how powerful God is, his justice, holiness and so on. They know a lot of facts about God, but now they haven't a clue about what God is like. They cannot know what God is like any more than a blind man can know about colors. Demons can have a strong sense of God's awesome majesty, but they don't see his loveliness. They have observed his work among the human race for these thousands of years, indeed with the closest attention, but they never see a glimmer of his beauty. No matter how much they know about God, and we've seen that they know very much indeed, the knowledge they have will never bring them to this higher spiritual knowing what God is like. On the contrary, the more they know about God, the more they hate him. The beauty of God consists primarily in his holiness or moral excellence, and this is what they hate the most. It is because God is holy that the demons hate him. One could suppose that if God were to be less holy, the demons would hate him less. No doubt demons would hate any holy being, no matter what he was like otherwise. But surely they hate this being all the more for being infinitely holy, infinitely wise and infinitely powerful. Wicked people including those alive today, will on the day of judgment see all there is to see of Jesus Christ, except his beauty and loveliness. 
There is not one thing about Christ that we can think of that will not be set before them in the strongest light on that brilliant day. The wicked will see Jesus coming in clouds with great power and glory, Mark 13, 26. They will see his outward glory, which is far, far greater than we can possibly imagine now. You know, the wicked will be thoroughly convinced of all who Christ is. They will be convinced about his omniscience as they see all their sins replayed and evaluated. They will know firsthand Christ's justice as their sentences are announced. His authority will be made utterly convincing when every knee will bow and every tongue confess Jesus as Lord, Philippians 2, 10 and 11. The divine majesty will be impressed upon them in quite an effective way as the wicked are poured into hell itself and enter into their final state of suffering and death, Revelation 20, 14 and 15. When that happens, all their knowledge of God, as true and powerful as it may be, will be worth nothing and less than nothing because they will not see Christ's beauty. Therefore, it is this seeing the loveliness of Christ that makes the difference between the saving grace of the Holy Spirit and the experiences of demons. This sight or sense is what makes true Christian experience different from everything else. The faith of God's elect people is based on this. When a person sees the excellence of the gospel, he senses the beauty and loveliness of the divine scheme of salvation. His mind is convinced that it is of God and he believes it with all his heart. As the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.34, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That is to say, as we explained before, unbelievers can see that there is a gospel and understand the facts about it, but they do not see its light. The light of the gospel is the glory of Christ, his holiness and beauty. Right after this we read 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Clearly, it is this divine light shining into our hearts that enables us to see the beauty of the gospel and to have a saving belief in Christ. This supernatural light shows us the superlative beauty and loveliness of Jesus and convinces us of his sufficiency as our Saviour. Only such a glorious, majestic Saviour can be our mediator, standing between guilty, hell-deserving sinners such as ourselves and an infinitely holy God. This supernatural light gives us a sense of Christ that convinces us in a way nothing else ever would. A true spiritual experience transforms the heart. When a most wicked sinner is caused to see Christ's divine loveliness, he no longer speculates why God should be interested in him to save him. Before, he couldn't understand how the blood of Christ could pay the penalty for sins. But now, he can see the preciousness of Christ's blood and how it's worthy to be accepted as the ransom for the worst of sins. Now the soul can recognize that he is accepted by God, not because of who he is, but because of the value God puts on the blood, obedience and intercession of Christ. Seeing this value and worth gives the poor, guilty soul rest which cannot be found in any sermon or booklet. When a person comes to see the proper foundation of faith and trust with his own eyes, this is saving faith. 
For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. John 6.40 I have revealed to you those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew me with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. John 17, 6-8 It is this sight of the divine beauty of Christ that captivates the wills and draws the hearts of men. A sight of the outward greatness of God in his glory may overwhelm men and be more than they can endure. This will be seen on the day of judgment when the wicked will be brought before God. They will be overwhelmed, yes, but the hostility of heart will remain in full strength and the opposition of the will continue. But on the other hand, a single ray of the moral and spiritual glory of God and of the supreme loveliness of Christ shone into the heart overcomes all hostility. The soul is inclined to love God as if by an omnipotent power, so that now not only the understanding, but the whole being receives and embraces the loving Saviour. A sense of the beauty of Christ is the beginning of true saving faith in the life of a true convert. This is quite different from any vague feeling that Christ loves him or died for him. These sort of fuzzy feelings can cause a sort of love and joy because the person feels a gratitude for escaping the punishment of their sin. In actual fact these feelings are, are based on self-love and not on a love for Christ at all. It's a sad thing that so many people are deluded by this false faith. On the other hand, a glimpse of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ causes the heart a supreme, genuine love for God. This is because the divine light shows the excellent loveliness of God's nature. A love based on this is far, far above anything coming from self-love, which demons can have as well as men. The true love of God, which comes from this sight of his beauty, causes a spiritual and holy joy in the soul, a joy in God and exulting in Him. There is no rejoicing in ourselves, but rather in God alone. Genuine spiritual experiences have different results. The sight of the beauty of divine things will cause true desires after the things of God, these desires are different from the longings of demons, which happen because the demons know their doom awaits them and they wish it could somehow be otherwise. The desires that come from this sight of Christ's beauty are natural free desires, like a, a baby desiring milk. Because these desires are so different from their counterfeits, they help to distinguish genuine experiences of God's grace from the false. False spiritual experiences have a tendency to cause pride, which is the devil's special sin. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. 1 Timothy 3.6 Pride is the inevitable result of false spiritual experiences, even though they are often covered with a disguise of great humility. False experience is enamoured with self and grows on self. It lives by showing itself in one way or another. A person can have great love for God and be proud of the greatness of his love. He can be very humble and very proud indeed of his humility. But the emotions and experiences that come from God's graces are exactly opposite. God's true working in the heart causes humility. They do not cause any kind of showiness or self-exaltation. That sense of the awesome, holy, glorious beauty of Christ kills pride and humbles the soul. 
The light of God's loveliness and that alone shows the soul its own ugliness. When a person really grasps this, he inevitably begins a process of making God bigger and bigger and himself smaller and smaller. Another result of God's grace working in the heart is that the person will hate every evil and respond to God with a holy heart and life. False experiences may cause a certain amount of zeal and even a great deal of what is commonly called religion. However, it's not a zeal for good works. Their religion is not a service of God but rather a service of self. This is how the Apostle James puts it himself in this very context. You believe there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? James 2, 19 and 20. In other words, deeds or good works are evidence of a genuine experience of God's grace in the heart. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. A man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 1 John 2, 3-4 When the heart has been ravished by the beauty of Christ, how else can it respond? How excellent is that inner goodness and true religion that comes from this sight of the beauty of Christ? Here you have the most wonderful experiences of the saints and angels in heaven. Here you have the best experiences of Jesus Christ himself. Even though we are mere creatures, it's a, a sort of participation in God's own beauty. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.4 God disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness, Hebrews 12.10. Because of the power of this divine working, there is a mutual indwelling of God and his people. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. 1 John 4.16 This special relationship has to make the person involved as happy and as blessed as any creature in existence. This is a special gift of God which he gives only to his special favourites. Gold, silver, diamonds and earthly kingdoms are given by God to people who the Bible calls dogs and pigs. But this great gift of beholding Christ's beauty is the special blessing of God to his dearest children. Flesh and blood cannot give this gift, only God can bestow it. This was the special gift which Christ died to obtain for his elect. It is the highest token of his everlasting love, the best fruit of his labours and the most precious purchase of his blood. By this gift, more than anything else, the saints shine as lights in the world. This gift, more than anything else, is their comfort. It is impossible that the soul who possesses this gift should ever perish. This is the gift of eternal life. It is eternal life begun. Those who have it can never die. It is the dawning of the light of glory. It comes from heaven. It has a heavenly quality, and it will take its bearer to heaven. Those who have this gift may wander in the wilderness, or be tossed by waves on the ocean, but they will arrive in heaven at last. There the heavenly spark will be made perfect and increased. In heaven the souls of the saints will be transformed into a bright and pure flame and they will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Amen.
Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed what you've seen, will you please share it with others? Get the word out. Thanks a lot. Take care.